you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first webinar, our first official training webinar for the New York Psychiatric Rehabilitation Training Academy. It's my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Daniela Labate Cavelli. I'm the Director of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiatives here at NIAPERS. And today I'm joined by Dr. Marianne Farkas for our first webinar, Using Psychiatric Rehabilitation to Support People to Develop Skills and Resources to Reach Their Goal. So we have a couple of things to get through before I turn it over to you, Marianne. First, I want to acknowledge all of our training partners. You'll see their uh, logos here on the screen today. And we have a bit of housekeeping to get through. So today's webinar, as you heard, is being recorded and you'll be able to find the PowerPoint as well as the recording on our website at psychrehabacademy.org in the archived training page. And we'll be posting that uh, by Friday. We are also offering 1.5 continuing education credits for LMSWs, LCSWs, CPRPs, and LMHCs. Now we've applied for continuing ed credits for SERPAs and other recovery support professionals, as well as KSACs, LCATs, and MFTs. We need you to complete an evaluation and indicate which continuing ed credit you're seeking and return it to us within 48 hours. So you have got to attend the entire webinar to qualify for CEs. And what will happen is we'll pull the registration report tomorrow. We'll send you the link to the evaluation as well as the recording. So if you're listening to us live, awesome. If you're listening to us recorded, you'll still be able to get your continuing ed credits. Unfortunately, this training was not approved uh, for credits by the certification board for New York certified um, peer specialists. We did apply and it was not approved. So we will continue to try to get them approved. And we'll let you know as each webinar goes through, goes on. We would love for you to continue to use the chat box like you've already been doing to communicate with us. Please be sure to type in your chat to everyone so that everyone sees your questions and your comments. Um, I'll be collecting your comments throughout Dr. Farkas's presentation. And then we've got some time set aside at the end for her to answer your questions. If we run out of time, um, there is certainly an office hours that will happen next week, and we intend on bringing those questions forward. You can also come to that office hour with more questions. Hopefully, you'll have some questions and once you've begun to marinate on the information that you're getting today. And we do want to remind you that the information you receive is accurate as of today's date. So if we talk about things related to prose or core, and then you might listen to this later on after prose redesign happens, for example, um, things may be slightly different, but we want you to know that the information you're getting is accurate as of today's date. Okay, let's try to move that slide. Okay. So a little bit about Dr. Farkas, and then I have just one other thing to tell you. So Dr. Marianne Farkas is the president-elect of the World Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association. She's also the director at Boston University's Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. She's also a professor at Boston University. She is one of the founding members of the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation under the direction of Dr. William Anthony, and along with... Um, all of her colleagues and coworkers, she's really been the main, one of the main contributors to the, to the field that we know today as psych rehab. And you can read all about her on our website and more about her on our slide, but I wanna give you time to really listen to her and talk to her. Um, so what she's gonna provide you with today um, is really the essence of psych rehab, right? What it really is. And we know that all of you have various ways that you incorporate some of this into your existing practices. And there may be some questions about how do you do this in your various service delivery environments. But what you're gonna to learn today and really what you'll be um, learning from us during the next 18 months is more details about these psych rehab technologies and techniques and how you can incorporate them into your program or your service structure models. So you'll get a clear idea of the concepts of psych rehab and then we'll work with you to learn the details of each of those concepts and then how to incorporate them into your daily practice, okay? So think about that. I just kind of want to level set a little bit and think about that as you listen to what Dr. Farkas has to say today. Um, and then of course we have some learning objectives. These will be directly related back to your evaluation. 
Um, but we hope that you'll increase your awareness of both the similarities and differences between recovery and psychiatric rehabilitation, that you'll gain some knowledge about the basic principles of recovery-oriented psychiatric rehabilitation, and gain an understanding of the basic components of what we're calling recovery-oriented psychiatric rehabilitation, or R-O-P-S-R. So another new acronym for us, right, Dr. Farkas? Huh. <laughs> always, always. That's right. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, before I do that, just a real quick note. If you are listening to us recorded, and even if you're not listening to us recorded, if you're listening to us live, we're using keywords today. So we're going to stop the presentation at three different pieces, places. And Dr. Farkas is going to give you a keyword. Please use that keyword on your evaluation so we know that you've been here for the entire training. We need to do that in order to make sure that we can provide CEs and that our um, training meets standards to provide CEs for the various um, professions. So with that, I am going to welcome you all in and turn it over to Dr. Marianne Farkas. Thanks, Daniela, for that introduction. And it's great to be here with everyone at the beginning of this exciting adventure. I'm sorry I can't see your face. I've been pushing to be able to see your face, but I know you're out there. I know you're out there. And I want to thank you for being here. And we're all here because we want to better help the people we serve. And this webinar will give you a first broad stroke overview of the approach that we're going to take to do that, which, as Daniela said, is recovery-oriented psych rehab. Those of you who are enrolled in the project will be learning each of the components and techniques while your agencies will be getting consultation to make sure that you have the support that you need to deliver this process when you become skilled at it. In this presentation, I'm going to be setting out some basic ideas. And as Daniela said, it's not going to be tailored to the individual programs that are represented here, because I'm just trying to get us on the same page about what do we mean by all these things. So I'm going to clarify the concept of recovery and recovery-oriented psych rehab. I'm going to share the background principles and give you an image of what the major components are. And at the end, I'm going to leave time, hopefully, for you to be able to ask uh, questions, as Daniela mentioned before. Someone is going to be monitoring the chat box. So if something comes to you along the way and you're worried you won't remember this question later, just put it in the chat. It'll help if you write Q&A question so that we can find that question when we're collecting everything um, to answer at the end. All right. So Let's see if I can advance the slide. Yes, I can. Yay. So I want to start with some of your thoughts. And the first question that I have that I'd like you to put into the chat is the answer to this question. What is one thing that you feel you do right now really well when you're working with the people you support? So what's one thing that you feel you do really well currently when you work with the people that you support and looks like listening is the number one right here okay listening what else Daniela all right we've got active listening meeting the client where they're at being supportive empathy building rapport wonderful motivational so, interviewing connecting with resources good okay so what I'm hearing, at least in the thread that um, Daniela was summarizing, is that you feel you do really well in the relationship end of the work that you're doing, which is terrific. Um, and of course, you know, I'm going to ask you the other side of that coin. What's one thing that you really want to do better and you're hoping to learn more about psychiatric rehabilitation in order to help you do that? So what's one thing you really want to do better and you're hoping that you're going to learn more about psychiatric rehabilitation to help you do that? Just put your answer in the chat, please. Engagement, motivational interviewing, more resources, motivation, empowering others, connecting with others. 
these are coming through fast and furious, Marianne, being creative, <laughs> resources, empowering again, lots of empowerment, lots of crisis management, resource programming, oh, resource programming, somebody's been doing their homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. Great. Identifying goals to move forward, empowerment, Perfect. facilitating meaningful engagement in their role in the community. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So there are lots of elements that you're hoping to learn more about um, from particularly from psychiatric rehabilitation in order to do better than you're doing. And it's kind of interesting that some of those answers are the same as the things that you feel really well, uh, that you do really well, I mean. So it must be that you do it really well, but you're hoping to do it better. And um, some of the details of psych rehab are what you're looking for. Okay, and as I said before, remember that today's presentation is the basic concepts and an overview. The details of how you do everything is what we're gonna spend the next 18 months or so learning together. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. So let me see. Why is the Office of Mental Health interested in supporting you in learning about recovery-oriented psychiatric rehabilitation, which is a mouthful to say 15 times, so maybe I just say RO psych rehab. Well, first of all, we know that abandoning asylums that is closing hospitals or getting people out of hospitals is not the same as helping people live a life. As Bill Anthony, um, who founded the Psychi Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation famously said once, freedom in a person's life that is unlocking the doors is not the same as life in that freedom. So, that's the interest in psychiatric rehabilitation. How do you help people to do more than just get out of an institutional setting? So I want to use the poll function. I think Eileen is going to help me with that. In order to find out if we're on the same page when speaking about both recovery and rehabilitation. So the question is, is recovery and psychiatric rehabilitation the same thing? Yes or no? If you think they are the same thing, please tell us which of the reasons listed below uh, explain how they are the same. If you don't think they're the same, in other words, if you think that they're different, don't answer this question too. And I think, uh, Daniela, you said to, that I could see the answers. Yep. So we'll have the poll go, and then we will share the answers on the screen. Okay. So the first question is, is it the same? The second question is, if you think they are the same, what are the uh, elements that explain how they are similar? We'll get to another question uh, for those who think they're different. So Daniela, I can't do the timing on this because I can't see if people are answering or not. Yep. So Eileen, can you give us a little bit of an update? Um, some people are saying they can't submit it. So I'm not sure if that's an internet thing, but we've got about 35, 36 answers to the bottom question. So there's there's some activity going on. Okay, so let's give it another minute or so. Let people read through these. Since we're starting you off with a two-part question. <laughs> yes, just to see if you're listening on your toes. Eileen, can you send me some information about how many people, what percentage said yes versus no? Well, I can tell you we've got 42% said yes and 58% said no. Okay. 
Yeah, if you, people are saying they're having trouble submitting. So once you check off all of the answers, you've got to scroll down to the bottom of the screen and click submit and you'll be able to get them all and get them all in. You've got to answer all of the questions to submit. So it looks like we should have a, an influx now. Is there a way that we can get to the people who think that it's not the same so they can answer? So if folks want to also type in their answers in the chat, you can certainly do that if you're having some challenges with the poll questions. So if you think they're not the same, you can chat in the why. Not the same. Folks are saying it's not the same. And not the it same. It looks like we've same. slowed down on answers. You want me to just end it? Yeah. Yeah. Can we see the results somehow? Yep. Perfect. Oh, okay. So both. People who think they are the same say they have the same philosophy and values, and most feel they're both about a journey to having a meaningful life. Uh, and then what was it for the second part, I mean, for the people who thought it was different? So for the people- yeah, There that, you go. Oh, I gotcha. If people, for the people that thought it was different, most folks said that recovery is the person's experience. Okay. And that also came up in the chat box. And then the second most chosen answer was uh, the second one, recovery can occur with or without participating. Okay, great. So that tells me uh, where you are relative to recovery and psychiatric rehabilitation. So let's compare what you said to what the research and the literature of first person accounts tell us. And I can't seem to advance the slide. Oh, there it is. All right. So the simplest way to talk about recovery is that it is, and you all have said it already, a person's journey to claim or reclaim a meaningful life. Now, some of the things to think about in that quick definition is what is a meaningful life and who decides? So there's an Egyptian proverb that said, he who has bread and something to dip it in has the whole of happiness. There are different definitions of um, happiness, of course. And I think I wanted to start by just saying that at the Center for Psych Rehab, we don't divide the idea of recovery into clinical recovery and personal recovery. Some people do do that because we believe that it's all personal. The personal definition of what is meaningful is something that nobody can dictate. And it can, excuse me, include a variety of elements. For some, reducing symptoms is a central feature of that. For others, symptoms hold a less central role in their overall recovery from the person's point of view. So that's why we don't divide uh, the, the notion of recovery. And we also understand that the view of what is a meaningful life is partially shaped by the community that the person is in, as in this proverb, and how that community views what is meaning, what is purpose, what is happiness, what is illness, what is well being. And it is also shaped by the person's own sense of identity in their community. So I want to talk for a minute about that if I can get this thing to move. All right. So there are people, pardon me, <laughs> who've spent their whole lives studying the concept of happiness and what it means and how meaning is determined. And if anyone's interested in the sole topic of uh, happiness, just contact me and I'll give you some literature to read about it. It's really fascinating. However, this is not a lecture about culture, recovery, and rehabilitation. Uh, so... This is going to be a real quick brush stroke, if you like. We want to understand um, 
what the factors are that can influence how a person answers the question, what is a meaningful life for you? And at the very least, some of those uh, factors include social values, the degree of acculturation of the particular group the person comes from, and the views of that community on mental illness or mental health. So social values can influence the definition, obviously, of a meaningful life or happiness. So if you asked a person from a First Nations background, for example, what their definition of happiness is, you might get something related to this being over doing, or living in the present over focusing on the future. And clearly that affects how we perceive if someone has that as their worldview. Um, we might, for people of African descent, meaning uh, non-Latino folks from say Brazil or Haiti or Jamaica, uh, understand that happiness includes feelings of kinship with other people in the group, even if they're not kin by blood, and a sense of role flexibility. What does that mean? It means a value placed on being able to switch roles for the good of the group. For example, grandparents raising kids, rather than strictly focusing on individual um, aims and goals in life. So it's more about a collective or a group. Again, I'm just giving you a broad stroke idea here in order to really take think about the factors that can influence what recovery means to people and the role of culture. Acculturation is can influence rather the range of beliefs, the extent to which a particular group of folks hold beliefs that are similar to that of the majority group or hold beliefs that are similar to that of their backgrounds or families, countries of origin. So individuals, for example, from a Latinx background who are less fluent in English and newer to America are more likely to hold beliefs that are traditional to their family's country of origin, while those who come from a Latinx background but are fluently bilingual and maybe second generation are more likely to be similar to the views of the larger culture. So simply knowing the ethnicity or cultural background that a person comes from doesn't tell you everything you need to know about what the meaning of a meaningful life is for that particular person in the community that they're in. Their views of, uh, of mental illness and mental health also color what's considered to be meaningful and how to go about it. In many Asian cultures, for example, as well as ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities, um, the idea of having a mental illness per se is considered a defect in the family that limits the possibility of siblings as well as the person um, who's undergoing the recovery journey of marrying well or sometimes of marrying at all. And therefore it limits the kind of life that people think that they can strive for. All of this can shape not only what we think of as important to attain, what our definition of meaning and happiness is, but also whether we ask for help, whom we ask for help, and for what. As a provider, all of this just means that we have to really be open to differences and to explore how people actually see things rather than assuming that we know because they come with a particular tradition or background written into their application or referral form. Okay. So. Recovery, whatever culture you come from, is defined by the person, it's their experience, that services can contribute or not. Any service in the system, regardless of what it is, can contribute to that journey, treatment, case management, or rehab, depending on how it's organized and what helpers do in their relationship with the people that they serve. And that's why we call rehabilitation in this context, recovery-oriented rehabilitation. Yes, it's the techniques of rehabilitation, but it's rehabilitation specifically designate, designed rather to contribute to the person's definition of a meaningful life. Just having PSR on the door 
doesn't mean that the program or services actually do that. So in a recovery-oriented system, we believe that all services should focus on one recovery vision or goal to organize those services, and that we should base services on recovery values. So what are the values demonstrated in any recovery-oriented service, whether it's rehabilitation, treatment, or otherwise? The first is person orientation. So rather than a focus on a case, recovery-oriented services uh, come from a position of respect. They focus on the full human experience, people's talents, interests, and strengths, which is linked to folks' sense of identity and self-acceptance. So what do we mean by that? Well, again, because of time, I can't go into it, the, <clears throat> this, pardon me, in great length, but I'm not talking so much about what you as a provider do, although that's important too, but I'm also talking about what does the agency do? Uh, what the agency does, what's built into the way the agency's organized. So for example, do the record keeping systems ask for a discussion of talents, interests, and strengths, or is it focused on people's deficit? Are there organizational structures which says to the person, we see you as a human being here. We're interested in all parts of you and not just one part of you. So that's person orientation. Partnership, instead of focusing on compliance or being a good client, so to speak, because you get along and do what you're told to do, is really best described as nothing about us without us. So partnership meaning no part of our organization occurs without representation from the people that are being served. Choice as opposed to coercion, no one thinks that they want, they are coercing people into doing things, but we have all kinds of subtle ways of getting people to do what we think is right. You know, if we say, oh, don't you think that's too stressful for you? Uh, maybe you should try something else. That's a way of coercing people, even if it's not overt. So a re recovery oriented service believes in the right to self-determination. It focuses on opportunities and activities that support fully informed decision-making, and that leads to meaning and empowerment. Recovery-oriented services are based on hope, on holding hope for people, as opposed to that sense of helplessness. And that's very difficult when you're understaffed, under pressure, uh, having too many clients to work with or people to um, partner with, it's hard to keep that hope alive, but it is a critical ingredient in trying to um, create change in a recovery-oriented service. So there's an emphasis on possibilities and aspirations. The, organiz the organization or the agency is designed to communicate the message that you believe in the person even if they do not believe in themselves. Okay, so if you are in a recovery-oriented service, that service will shift the role of the provider. The traditional role of the provider uh, of any service, clinical treatment, case management, PSR, whatever, um, has been in the past assessing illness, leading to problem solving, choosing specific treatments for specific identified problems. And that means that the provider then is the expert at solving or fixing the problem. And certainly when I was first trained in clinical psychology, which is my background, that's what I was trained to think about myself as. I was the expert at solving or fixing the problem. The role of the person being served is that of a good reporter providing correct information. If I ask you the right questions and you answer with the correct information, you're a good patient so that the correct treatment can be delivered and following the expert's instructions. In recovery-oriented services where the provider is a recovery-promoting provider, the focus of attention is helping the person develop their, their own recovery vision, helping the person to define their own personal medicine, as Pat Deegan calls it, that could be inside or outside the mental health service system. And the role of the provider is that of a consultant, a coach, or a teacher. The role of the person in recovery is that of an expert in their own recovery. 
Okay. So with this information, let's think about what's called TSR. So the first keyword that I'm supposed to communicate to you is the color red. So remember the color red, it's the first keyword that uh, you need to know to get credit here. All right, back to the slide. The popularity of PSR over the last three or four decades has led to distortions in which almost everything done with people with serious pardon me, mental health conditions was considered psych rehab. And we know that when everything is something, then nothing is that uh, really. So anything done with people with schizophrenia, for example, must be a PSR. Anything including skill teaching must be PSR. Anything to do with employment must be PSR. And um, it's not the case. So if that is not it, what is it really? Recovery shifts the paradigm for services to focus on promoting well-being and a meaningful life rather than primarily focusing on decreasing illness. So recovery-oriented psych rehab is one service in an array of service, you saw that circle that I put up before, that can put that shift into practice by focusing on the basic principle. And the basic principle is that having success and satisfaction in a valued role is a function of having the critical skills and supports to achieve it. That's the basic principle. Having success and satisfaction in a valued role is a function of having the critical skills and supports to achieve it. And that valued role is the expression of one part of the person's meaningful life. And that's how it connects back to recovery. Here's another way to describe it. So if you think about the array of services that exist in any well-functioning mental health system, then each service can be defined by its expected outcome. So we expect treatment services to produce symptom relief, regardless of what we call that service. We expect rehabilitation services to produce role functioning. That's the job of rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is focused on role functioning by societal participation as well as activity. The categorization across the top comes from the World Health Organization. And I wouldn't worry about it at the moment. If you get the idea that how rehabilitation is distinguished in an overall system is a focus on role functioning, either by increasing or changing activity or helping people to participate in opportunities, then you've got the basic idea. Okay, so I've given you two ways of thinking about psychiatric rehabilitation. And remember that we said that services can contribute to recovery or not, depending on how they're organized and what the helpers do within that particular service. We see recovery as the overall mission of a well-functioning service, and therefore the contribution that recovery-oriented psych rehab makes to that overall mission is by focusing on role functioning. All right, so what about the foundations of ROPSR? Where does it come from? The basis of recovery-oriented psych rehab is psychological research and techniques that come from these fields, mostly psychology, but also social psychiatry, community psychiatry, things like ecological psychology and positive psychology. So it draws its research and techniques from those fields, quite a variety of fields. Rehabilitation principles, which I mentioned before, success and satisfaction in a preferred environmental role is a function of skills and supports. And that principle derived from the research and techniques really dictates what recovery-oriented psych rehab focuses on. So it's a focus on success and satisfaction, not just success, but also satisfaction, because we know 
in everyday life that you can be very successful and miserable. You can also be happy and not very successful. We want people to have both success and satisfaction. Where? In a preferred environmental role. Why? Because role functioning is the job of rehabilitation. So a preferred environmental role means worker, tenant, student, parent. That's an environmental role in society. And that getting there, achieving that role is a function of skills and support. So not just skills, but supports. I can do my job today, not only because of the skill that I may or may not have in communicating with you, but also because of the support that I get from Niaparis uh, and from the people who are dealing with the technological issues of running a webinar. If I didn't have that support, I couldn't really speak to you this afternoon. So skills and supports together uh, produce success and satisfaction in an environmental role preferred by the person. So the research techniques and principles run through the recovery values, which we spoke about briefly, person orientation, partnership, choice, and her hope. And you will see that in the way that it's organized in order to produce what we call recovery-oriented psych rehab. So the research and the techniques, the principles, the values, all together produce recovery-oriented psychiatric rehabilitation. So I've said a lot of stuff and I'm trying to hurry so that doesn't always come across very well. So I wanna just give you the essence when all is said and done of what psychiatric, recovery-oriented psychiatric rehabilitation is actually. So you understand that at its core, we focus on seeing the person, their talents, interests, and skills, not the label or the disability. What do we know about the people we support? Do we know what their talents and interests are? Are we so busy fixing their problems that that's all we see? So the process, the structured process of RO psych rehab helps us to stay focused on the person, not their illness. The second essence of psychiatric rehabilitation is the idea of partnership. So the best way to describe it is in this sort of image. So in psychiatric rehabilitation, the techniques and the processes that we've developed are to help you not drag the person to the finish line or carry the person to the finish line, but to create a active partnership for the two of you to work on a particular role that the person wants. So remember that when you get to dragging people along, that often comes from the person having learned that being a good client means that you're passive in the mental health process and you take very little initiative. So if you speak your mind in most traditional mental health services, you're not particularly well-liked as a client, you get into trouble. So people learn to be passive in order to get the services that they want. Um, and partnership means not only listening to what people have to say, but to help, help them to shift from that passivity to being an actor, being fully human yourself in any interaction and still getting the work done. Judy Chamberlain, I think, once famously said, people keep talking about me being the driver of my process when half the time I'm not even in the car. So partnership in psychiatric rehabilitation is a set of skills and techniques as well as the heart to create more of the right-hand side of the slide than the left. Okay, another essential element of rehabilitation is that it's supporting the person not doing it, but supporting that person to figure out what role they want and where, in which environment. So we, because we all have multiple roles that are important to us in our sense of identity. So in the living environment, it might be a landlord, a tenant, a roommate, a family member. In the learning environment, your role as an apprentice is different than a role of being a college student. 
in the working environment, working full-time, part-time, working as a chef versus a secretary, all of those things are create very different demands and different paths to achieving that valued role. In socializing, we could socialize through a dance club as a member or perhaps a, in a faith community as a deacon. So the essence of ROPSR is to support the person to figure out what role they want, rather than matching the person with what role you think they should have. And each role has its own specific skills and supports that are necessary in general to be successful, but specifically for that person's satisfaction. So supporting the person in figuring out that role also includes what are identifying what the skills and supports are that they have and that they need for that role in that setting. As I said, helping a person get a job is very different from helping pers a person work part-time as a pastry chef. The skills you already have are only strengths if they match the requirements of the role in the setting that you want to be in. The fact that I'm not great at math is mean, meaningless to my role as a professor, thank God. What is critical to that role is communicating, but not just any communicating, a special kind of communicating, being able to clarify ideas by turning concepts into examples that people can relate to. That's the skill of communicating that's critical to the job that I have. As a mother, a different role I have, that's not my critical communication skill. There, I have to be expert at negotiating conflicts so that my two kids won't kill each other at the dinner table. Obviously, if I spoke like this at home at the dinner table, they would think something was wrong. So specificity in the critical skills that are needed have everything to do with the role and the setting that the person is trying to achieve. As I said, um, it's not just about skills, it's also su uh, about support. If I didn't have help launching the poll questions or monitoring the chat, I'd be too overwhelmed in this presentation to remember what I'm saying. I'm struggling at, <laughs> at the moment. Um, and that support's only relevant to this role in this setting. Monitoring a chat box is obviously not a critical support that I need as a mother at home. So in summary, what I've said is that the essence of psychiatric rehabilitation is seeing a process that helps you to see the person, not the disability, develop a trusting and full partnership where both people are active, supporting the person to figure out what role they want, the specific role they want, not just in general, in which environment, and supporting that person in developing and carrying out a plan to use the skills and resources they already have while developing the ones they need to be successful and satisfied. All right, so how are we going to do that? Overall, psychiatric rehabilitation is a framework. It's a logic model. It helps you to organize different interventions into a process from the person's perspective that helps that person figure out if they are ready to even consider a role. And if not, it helps them to develop that willingness. So the overall framework that we use is called choose, get, and keep. And why do we use that? Because people understand what that means. If you talk to most people who come to mental health services and you say, okay, we're gonna help you to choose a role that's really important to you and help you get it and keep it, people go, uh-huh, okay, I get that. So it's that overall logic model that helps you to organize a whole bunch of different interventions that you may already have in your toolbox in order to help people to first consider a valued role? Are they ready to consider that valued role? How can you help them to develop a willingness to consider that role? And then to choose that valued role, get it, and then keep it. 
So things that you may already have learned, which I heard in the chat box, like motivational interviewing, mutual peer support, can help a person become more willing, for example, to think about their future. Shared decision-making um, can help a person choose a role. Cognitive remediation can help a person get and keep that role, et cetera, et cetera. Recovery-oriented PSR can weave these different interventions together into one coherent process, along with other techniques that we'll also teach you, uh, to result in the person choosing, getting, and keeping the role. All right. So that sounds simple enough. Let's, quote-unquote, listen in. PSR ideas are obviously not new in New York. And most of you do do some kind of role or life goal setting, service planning and development or support activities to overcome the barriers. So let's just listen to this interaction or I'll read it to you. Hi, John, what can I help you with today? I think I wanna get a job right away. Right away, what kind of job? Anything's okay, I wanna make some money. I got my GED last year. I met a girl in my neighborhood and I want to ask her out, but I don't have much money. I ran out of money a few days before the end of the month. My SSI check doesn't go that far. I think I spend too much money on cigarettes and beer. Can you help me with these applications? Wow, you really feel under pressure to get a job quick. Have you tried to get a job already? I got a stop and shop and a McDonald's application. They take almost anybody. You're really eager to get going, but you also want your efforts to be realistic. Let's take a look at these forms. Okay, if, Eileen, if you could launch the next poll question, I'd appreciate it. Eileen? I think I can do that for you, Marianne. Okay. I'm in, oh, there it goes. I need the support. I need the support. <laughs> it's up. It's up. All right. So thinking about the interaction I just read, do you consider it to be a good, incomplete, or bad example of a provider delivering recovery-oriented PSR? The second question is, do you consider this interaction to be a good example of the provider engaging the person? A good example of the provider helping the person to choose or set a goal? A good example of the provider helping the person get their goal? None of the above, all of the above. Are you helping me see the results so let's give it like 30 more seconds because people can choose more than one for that second question and then we'll go ahead and share the results with everybody. okay one mississippi two mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to keep people engaged right Miriam? yeah yeah <laughs> exactly Uh, that's odd. We're getting some notes in the chat that people are not able to see the poll. I can see it on my end. Huh. Well, that is... Eileen, are people answering the poll? Eileen is not... Yes, there. I've got about... There's, yeah, quite a few. I've oh, got 164 okay. for one oh. response. Okay, so maybe it's just a, a okay. Well, given those given books. that we're running a little behind, can let's, you yeah, just tell me it. roughly uh, what did we get for one so far? It looks like it slowed down. You want me to just end it and show the results? Yep. Yeah. There you go. Okay, sixty percent say it's an incomplete example, and. People are sort of divided in terms of what they think it's a good example of. All right, let's close that up. What this, what this example really demonstrates is that even supportive 
and skilled helpers who believe themselves to be person-centered, as this person does, can mistake the person's attempts to solve their immediate problem as the role goal they are motivated to work on. John wants a girlfriend, so a job for him is the solution to that problem, which is fine until a person changes their mind because the goal that they set is not about the future, but the present. Okay, let's keep going. So, why can I not keep going? You see why I need the support for technology because I can't get it to move. There it is. You got All it. Right. Okay. So later on, what are they saying? What can I help you with today, says the helper. Well, I thought about the stop and shop job. I don't want to do that. Thanks for helping me with the application. John's very polite. But I changed my mind. When I was a kid, I was in a hospital a lot. I like the idea of being a physical therapist. They helped me a lot with my scoliosis. Maybe I should do that. You know that a good choice needs to be based on figuring out what is important to you. I'm really impressed by the fact that you spent time reflecting on your choices. I wonder if when you were thinking about it, you knew what it takes to be a physical therapist. Well, not really. Well, John, like you, I really want you to be successful in taking this next step. To be a PT, however, you have to go to college, and that's not an easy degree to get. You passed the GED, but remember how many times you had to try to get a pass? One thing we don't want to happen is for you to get so stressed out that you relapse again. It's important to take it slow. I just don't want you to be disappointed. Think about jobs that don't involve so much stress and schooling. Uh, so you don't think I can be a physical therapist. All right, so we're gonna skip the polling because it's just easier this way. While the helper may be using some techniques of shared decision-making here, they're really acting in the role of a gatekeeper, a kind gatekeeper, mind you, but a gatekeeper. The helper is the one who's putting the brakes on the person an indirect way to steer that person away from goals the helper thinks won't work and towards that, those goals that the helper thinks is appropriate. And that's not what we mean by choosing in a recovery-oriented PSR program. Let's just finish this up by where they ended up. Hi, John, how are things going today? You know that girl I wanted to take out? I saw her with this guy from the neighborhood. I should have gotten that job sooner. You feel like you missed your chance. You must be disappointed. Listen, if you're still interested in getting a job, there is an opening in a transitional employment program I heard about recently. It's in food service. I think that would be a really good way to learn uh, skills for a real job. I'm trying to do two things here at once. Um, it's in food service. It's not so much pressure as well. Why not give it a try? Okay, I don't know, I, I'm not into food service stuff. You don't have to do it forever. It's a way to get back into the world of work. From there, you can move on to other things once you get comfortable with working, getting up on time, following directions, getting along with others. What do you think? Okay, if you think that's what's best. This interaction may be using some tools of motivational interviewing, specifically active listening, but it demonstrates the way an interaction can become helper-directed, not person-directed. Did you notice the energy in John's responses as compared to uh, the beginning of the series of interactions? In the first interaction, he starts out excited, and in this one, he ends up being sort of passive and resigned. It's very hard to work towards having a meaningful life from a place of resignation. But what about people from who have unrealistic goals, some of you might be asking? Should you just let them do what they want and watch them fail? That is not the only other alternative. ROPSR gives the person the tools they need to make their own informed choice with the provider in the role of a consultant or teacher, not in charge of the outcome. How? Stay tuned.
So Marianne, I just need to interrupt you for a second. There's a ton of stuff happening in the chat box that this is a really bad example um, and, and that it's not a, a great example of a helper relationship. So I just wanted to sort of reiterate that your point of this example is to show that this is not a good example, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. So I can't see the chat, so thank you for pointing that out. But the fact that you know that this is not a good example is very hopeful. Yes. Exactly. It may have some good things about it. It is active listening, but it's very directive. And it takes away from the person's energy and enthusiasm, and it's not partnership. So the essence of psych uh, recovery-oriented psych rehab is giving you a systematic process of using techniques to engage the person with you, as I said, as the consultant coach or expert teacher to help that person consider, choose, get, and keep successfully the role that they really want, even if they begin by not knowing what they want or being able to not being able to think through what that is. You start, as you said, some of you, with where the person is at. In today's webinar, especially given where we are in time, I can't lay out all these techniques, but we can give you an idea of what you're going to be learning over the next year or so if you're enrolled in the teaching program. So I'm going to now give you a sense of that process that we've been talking about. Um, since this is, process is conducted with the person as the main actor, we've organized the process around the questions that we're looking to help the person to answer. So let's see what those are. Readiness to consider a role goal. The first question, the first part of the process is answering the question, am I really prepared to set a goal about some role I'd like? Some people are and some people are not. Our job is to help that person figure it out if they are ready to consider a role goal. So for some people, that seems like a pie in the sky idea. And the techniques of ROPSR help that person to get from that point to a point where they are ready to consider that goal. Then helping the person to... Um, set an overall rehab goal, which answers the question, where and in what role do I want to live, learn, work, or socialize? And you know what I'm going to do? Let's see. Hmm. The reason I'm hesitating is because the way I wanted to go through this is too long. So I'm just going to go ahead if I can. Nope. All right. I'll try to go through all of these one by one uh, in this in what we're discussing coming up. So let me just start with this. There are certain elements and techniques to help someone consider the role goal, specify that overall goal, figure out the skills they need, figure out the supports they need, put the information together to plan, and then either learn what they absolutely don't know how to do, practice things they already know how to do but can't do correctly in the right way, in the right time with the right person, um, or develop resources, which involves linking with resources that exist or creating new resources if the ones that the person needs don't happen to exist. All right. So if I sound confused, it's because I'm trying to figure out how to get through this without either killing you by moving so quickly or uh, leaving half of it out because there are too many things to talk about. All right, so in terms of being willing to consider a role goal, our beliefs matter in terms of what we're willing to consider. And in the area of beliefs here, we're interested in John's sense about not having a job. Is he dissatisfied? Is he satisfied? Does he think that change is desirable? 
you can be very unhappy with what you've got and still not be willing to change. So you have to be both unhappy, dissatisfied, and see change as something that you want, desirable. Does he see change as possible? Is it something that he might want things to change, but really in his mind, he can't even imagine that's in, within the realm of possibility. Does he think he has the support to make any kind of change we're talking about manageable? And does he see it as posi positive? Some people view changes, pardon me, as negative because that's their experience in their life. Whatever, Whenever a change has happened, they've all, always lost more than what they've gotten. So in order to be willing to consider a role goal, we have to understand how dissatisfied the person is, how desirable they think a change is, whether they think it's pos possible or positive. And based on what we saw, we don't know. Uh, John's dissatisfied with his social life, not his working life. We know he wants a life with a girlfriend and money, et cetera. So we know that he thinks change is desirable because he wants something besides what he's got. He comes up with different changes. So he might see change as possible, but we really don't know. And in terms of whether he sees a uh, change as positive, right now, the only thing we know about him is that he hopes it will get him a girlfriend. So in other words, we really don't know what John's beliefs are in order for, to help him answer the question of whether he's willing to even think about a role goal. The second half of this is whether he's prepared to consider a role goal. So your beliefs are one thing that affects your openness to considering some kind of change. The other is what do you know about that kind of change? There are three critical areas of knowledge that a person needs to explore. What do I already know about my personal criteria? What, what are my values? What do I care about in making any choice? What do I know about how an environment and roles function? Do I understand the way environments are organized? Not this specific one, but just the idea of environments and what their characteristics imply for me. And what do I know about how to make a decision that fits me? If I'm a person who is impulsive a lot of the time, then I may not know much about how to make a structured, fully formed goal. So all of these things, beliefs and knowledge, get put together in order to help the person decide if they really are willing and prepared to consider setting an overall goal at the moment. So this is just all the things we know and we don't know. Marianne, could you share that second keyword with folks, please? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. And the second keyword is green. Green is the second keyword. So we're trying to help him answer whether this is a good moment for him to start thinking about some role or setting. And in order for John to be the driver in setting a goal later on, we have to explore with him to find out the answer to these potential gaps before we get into the whole process of actually setting a goal. What if he's not ready to consider a goal, but he wants it? Let's say we don't wanna lose John, so we go with his desire for an immediate job, well, not in food service though, we use that immediate job, if we're talking about jobs, to uh, experience to help him identify how he feels about having a job, what he likes and he doesn't like about the one that he got, whatever it was, what he understands about supervisors, paychecks, work colleagues, et cetera. So we use the experience in order to respond to his immediate need and then go back and system systematically set a role goal. Okay. Once we have both have a handle on the belief and knowledge the person brings to the table, we can work on a systematic process. So what is that systematic process of setting a goal? Um, we want to be able to set up things so that instead of asking people, well, what's your overall goal? What do you want? Because most people can't answer that. We help them 
to figure out if they want to stay in the role and setting they're in and grow, make it better, or they want to go somewhere else. That's the first level of decision. And then we create a process that helps to teach the person how to identify personal criteria, what's important to me in making a choice, what environmental characteristics are and what that implies, and helping them to learn how to compare them in a structured process. So instead of suggesting what's important for the person to think about cost, location, or how many semesters it's going to take to become a PT, the process teaches the person how to think through what is important to them specifically. The process of researching environments helps people learn what's important to research when you consider a certain kind of setting, not giving them three options to look at. Uh, <clears throat> so a role goal names the role in a specific setting in place within a timeline of six to 24 months. Why six to 24 months? Because what may be impossible to do next week may be possible in six months or 24 months if you give me enough time to learn the skills I need to learn or get the resources that I need to get. It states an intention in I language. So the goal is about I, what I intend to do. And it's the driver for the entire rest of the process. So here's an example for John. I intend to graduate from a PT assistant program at Regis College in 24 months. When he put together his personal criteria, environmental characteristics, and then a structured decision-making process, he ended up with this statement. Another example it might be, I intend to live with a roommate in my current apartment on the east side until June of 2024. So that's an example of a role goal in which he has decided to stay where he is and improve things, as opposed to the first one in which he uh, intends to go somewhere else uh, within 24 months. So I gave you two here just to, so you can see what it looks like in different domains. Normally, you only use one. Okay. So once you have that goal, that specific goal about where and in what role you want to be within six to 24 months, specific timeline, you then help the person to identify what's required. So that's the definition of success. What's required in that specific role, in that specific place, and what the person needs for their own satisfaction in the role and setting. Using that information, you help the person understand what skills they're already good at or need to meet the requirement of the role or what skills they have or need to feel comfortable and satisfied there. We use the same process to identify critical supports because the principle is skills and supports make the difference. You need both skills and supports. John having grooming skills may be nice, but does he have the ability to match the culture of the Regis College campus in how he presents himself? That might be more critical. Does he have the resources, clothes, budget, et cetera, to get the clothing and accessories he needs to blend in? Skills and supports required and for my own satisfaction. So a goal by itself is not enough. A plan is not enough. You need to know what skills and supports you already have for that role in that place and what critical supports you need to improve skills and supports. So can I really do the critical skills that will really make a difference. Not every single skill in the world, but the critical ones that will really make a difference. And then understanding what's required and what do I need to make that place a role and setting that I want to stay in. So the requirement for John might be taking tests. The skill for success would look like this. The percentage of time per month, John highlights important words in all test questions on the monthly quiz. That's the skill he needs in order to meet that requirement. His current level of functioning is zero. His needed level of functioning is 90%. The fact that he can't do it at all is going to mean, mean a different kind of intervention than if he could do it a little bit. The skill related to satisfaction, 
for John, he would really like to have relationships on campus. So in exploring all of that, the skill that was identified was the percentage of time per week John does quiet yoga breathing, not loud and noisy that makes him look strange, quiet yoga breathing before speaking to another student when he identifies himself as anxious. Again, the important thing is that it's specific and it's also something that you do together with John, understanding what the requirements of the environment are and what's necessary for John in order to feel like this is going to be a role in a setting that I want to stay in. Okay. So we do the same thing with support. Skills are what you do. Supports are what you have. What's necessary to be successful and satisfied, what's required. So the requirement for John might be to have money for fees. The support he needs is the number of times per semester that his VR counselor approves full VR funding for his school fees. And right now, the VR counselor approves it three times a semester is its partial payments. And the needed level of support is three. So that's the strength. The fact that his current level and needed level are the same makes it a strength. A support related to his satisfaction, the percentage of time the faculty creates assignments that are able to be read in the Kurzweil system. Because for John, hearing uh, the information in the lecture and in the homework assignments is what helps him to process better. And that's not required. The program doesn't require that he do that. That's what he needs in order to be able to do the work with the least amount of stress possible. All right. So now I know what skills and supports ob objectives to target the needed level in each category. I need to understand what I'm going to do with all this information. And by itself, the information is nice, but it's not enough. So person-centered planning tells me the answers to those questions. So person-centered planning a la recovery-oriented PSR, the overall role goal drives the plan. The skills and supports that the person has are used in the plan. The critical priority skills and supports the person doesn't have become objectives. Interventions are specific to overcoming the gap between the current and needed level. Needed levels are used to assess if the person has developed the skills and supports after an intervention ends. So it's important in a plan to have not only where the person starts, but where the person needs to end in order to be successful and satisfy, because that becomes the evaluation tool that you use after an intervention to see if you are where you need to be. Okay, and last of all, the person is in the room to create the plan. So what do I mean by the person is in the room to create the plan? I mean that simply asking the person to sign the plan is not what we mean by partnership. Uh, not to mention helping the, the process of helping the person understand the process they're going through. Since we developed the skill and support assessments that I breathlessly told you about a few minutes ago, with the person, they were in that process, you were acting as a consultant, teaching them that process, coaching the person to do it. The person is more likely to understand what they're working toward to get to the role and setting they want. The plan is simply matching the kind of intervention to the data. If the skill is zero, we teach. If there is some skill, we practice for use. If the support is zero and exists, we link. If the support is zero and doesn't exist, we try to create. It's very simple and straightforward and done specifically so that people can be involved. Okay, so this is an excerpt from a plan because I couldn't get it all on the screen. You'll see that this information came from the assessment and it is, involves both the skills and supports. So 90% of the time per month, that's the needed level that John needs in order to be able to take the required tests. John highlights important words in all test questions. 
within the time allotted. Why does it need to be that specific? Because that's what John needs in order to be successful. If he just learns how to highlight important words, he may not be able to do it when it's in a test situation. <laughs> Excuse me. And he may be able to do it, but he may not be able to do it within the time allotted. So each of those phrases reflects some aspect of John's functioning related to the particular role that he wants. So his current level of functioning is zero. The intervention is skill teaching. Who's going to do it? The academic skills coach. And we identify when that intervention is going to begin and when it ends. And then we keep track of when it actually begins and ends so that we can adjust our expectations. So um, with quiet yoga breathing, John already can do this 20% of the time, but he needs to be able to do it 75% of the time in order to have the kind of relationships that he wants because he gets too anxious and he walks out of the room instead of trying to speak to people. And so skill practice is going to help him to identify why is it that he can do it some of the time, but he can't do it all of the time. Is it that he forgets to do it when he gets nervous? Is it that he can do it with some people? He can't do it with all the people he wants to do it with. Is it that he doesn't do it as often as he needs to do it? So we explore with him what are the elements that are the barriers to him using something he already knows how to do. And then we develop a little program for him to overcome that specific barrier. It might be practice, it might be rehearsal, uh, it might be having cue cards to help him remember, at least at the beginning. But whatever it is, that skill practice is so that he can use the skill that he already has. And we do the same thing for the supports. How am I doing on time here? Well, Marianne, um, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes. All right. So I need to go through the last and then I'll pass it over to, back to you. Okay. Sounds good. So that's the plan. And that person center planning tells us what intervention is needed and who's going to do it. Now we got to do it. So John knows how to do a lot already. Got a GED. These are all the things he already knows how to do. Skill teaching is needed for him to learn how to pick out important words on test questions. So even though he knows how to do a lot, this thing is something he doesn't know how to do. And if you actually don't know how to do something, the teaching has to be thorough. And at the end of it, you have to be able to demonstrate the skill if you want to achieve the goal. So what is skill teaching? It's systematic. It's tell, show, do, didactic modeling and practice for each step. It's repeated until the person correctly demonstrates the skill in role play. If you know how to do it already, then you need skill practice, as I mentioned before. So what it takes for skills to be useful, you tell something about each step, you show each step, you have a little practice of each step, and then you have help the person figure out what are the barriers to using the step uh, skill in the real environment. Skill teaching isn't needed often, it's just about 20% of the time, but when it's needed, it has to be done comprehensively or the skill never gets learned. So that's about skills. Support development answers the question, what has to happen for me to get the supports that I don't have? And how do I create a support if it doesn't already exist? So um, we use marketing, persuasion, tailoring, and support of the, of the linking process in order to make that link actually work. Or we create something new. Now, what do I mean by creating something new? For example, we had a person who was isolated in their apartment in a rural area and had nowhere to meet people who were not associated with the mental health center. So we worked with the nearby town library to develop a book club that rotated where it was held in different people's homes, including the person's apartment. We created a resource that wasn't there before, but specifically designed to help that person. All right. So support interventions, linking, I just mentioned this, creating, 
And here's an example of using persuasion, identifying what the deficit is in the link, developing a plan, and marshalling, which is really inspiring somebody in the real environment to create that link. To develop Here, in this case, it's developing a relationship with faculty to identify a champion for John to form a team with him to encourage the sustainment of faculty. All right, so when you've done all this, You've engaged the person in full partnership to answer all these questions. You will have helped them to reach the role and setting they're motivated to work towards to have a better chance of getting and keeping um, the environments that they want. And you've given them the tools to work on the next role that they're going to have in the future. And that's what we mean by recovery-oriented PSR. So how do we know if it's effective? Just using the basic essential elements of, rehabil of uh, recovery-oriented PSR. We track, did the person achieve an environmental role that they wanted? Did they in fact increase their functioning by having more skills and supports that helped them to meet that demand when we finished than when we started? Do they have increased satisfaction? Do they have the skills and supports they need to be satisfied in that role so that they'll stay there longer and get the benefit of it? The last key word for those of you uh, who need to know it is the color blue. Blue is the last key word. I want to, I've said a lot of things in a very short period of time and I ran faster and faster as we got through this. So I want you to remember that learning how to do this with the variety of people that you support will take going through all of the elements that Daniela has already mentioned in the, that are going to happen in the project over the next 18 months. Uh, today is just opening the door to that journey. So I wanna leave you with a final thought. When all is said and done, Epictetus, this was the Greek philosopher of the first and sec second century AD, said it well. ROPSR boils down to this, helping the person figure out what to say to themselves in terms of what their aspiration is, and then helping them to do it. So thank you for hanging in. Hopefully there are a few uh, minutes left for you to be able to answer questions and um, also to come to the office hours if you don't get your question answered. Thanks, Marianne. If you could just let me advance the next slide or perfect. So we have a couple of reference slides that we want to share. And then you'll have access to the PowerPoint as well as the recording on the website. I'm going to come back to this slide with the questions in a second. Um, a couple of things that sort of recurring themes um, that we'll mention, and then we have a few questions, but I do want to encourage you all that you, we have a podcast that's going to be put on the website um, by Monday. So check back on Monday for the podcast, and that'll be sort of the um, a place for you to listen to the experience of psych rehab and what Marianne was just talking to us about. So be sure to check the website on Monday for the podcast. And then make sure you register for our office hour. Um, you'll have, again, you'll have an hour of Dr. Farkas and access to her. So think about um, all of the questions you put in the chat box. Think about what you've heard today and how that sort of fits with what you're doing. Um, and then be sure to bring your questions about psych rehab and where these services sort of fit into the larger behavioral health system and, and your service system that you deliver services in. So um, I am gonna go through, we have, a, let's see, about five minutes. Uh, and I think we can get through a few questions. I will start off here. Oops, I will not start off here because I just shut my screen down. Ha ha, but I got it back. Okay, so the first question we have is around um, a resource. If you could just share a resource about psych rehab that people could go to like a book or anything like that, I can tell you all that we already have um, a number of resources up on the website. So you can check that out. There's some articles as well, but Marianne, if you could offer some uh, books maybe that people can check out, folks have been asking for that. Yes, I think uh, I mentioned two of them on the reference list. One is called surprisingly enough, psychiatric rehabilitation. 
and it's by Anthony and Company, second edition, and the reference is on the slides that um, Daniela went through. And the other is called The Essential Guide to Psychiatric Rehabilitation, which talks about services using psychiatric rehabilitation, and um, it goes through each of the pieces that I've been talking about. It's a shorter book. That's also, I believe, on the reference list, okay. which I don't have in front of me. Perfect. Um, so let's see, for future trainings, people are curious about getting copies ahead of time. That kind of thing is something that we're going to talk about, but we certainly do give you copies of the PowerPoint afterwards on the website. I know people want to try to follow along and take notes, um, but you can certainly have access to them and we'll talk about um, if that's something that we can manage to do. Um, there's a question about CEUs for CTRSs. Unfortunately, we are not able to provide those at this time. There is a question, um, let's see. Ah, does psych rehab always have to be obviously systematized? Often we cover these bases, but aren't as systematized as this. Often the clients we work with seem to resist and are overly structured to this kind of systematic approach. Do you want to comment on that, Dr. Farkas? Yes, um, I will comment on that. If you think about what I had said originally, that part of what we do in this kind of PSR is to teach people the process, not just get to the answer. It's important to have it be structured so that people can actually do it and be the leader. Otherwise, what happens is, um, A, we respond to people's impatience and anxiety, which definitely we, we want to include in the way that we respond. But at the end of it all, that person often doesn't have a clue what process it was that they just went through. If you're doing it in a structured way, at least what I've done myself and supervised others to do, often the person who is receiving the service will be the one to say, oh, uh, isn't it time to figure out what, are, what the skills are that I have? And that's what we mean by being the driver of the process. They know what they are, are supposed to be doing in order to be able to achieve something and they are taking the lead more often than you are taking the lead. So how do you respond to the impatience? Sometimes it's because people don't really understand what it's going to take for them to get to where they want to go. And sometimes you have to do kind of like what IPS does, help the person get to the environment quickly and then sort of go backwards and recycle the process starting from there. Okay, now that you're here, let's do some goal setting to figure out if this is the place you really wanna stay. Is this the place you really wanna be in for the next two years? And you go through the process related to that. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Okay. Best uh, I can do in the moment. Go ahead. Uh, Sounds good. Okay, so there's a, another one. Can you comment about the difference between learn helplessness and someone who's just who just has low motivation and or a personality in which they shy away from some active initiation in activities? For instance, they may just not want to do such and such. Uh, this person who wrote this in has a client who gets TV dinners because he doesn't want to wash dishes. But now that he's in a new apartment with a dishwasher, he says, I can cook now. Okay, well, I think that's a very good example of, <laughs> of uh, what we know about motivation. So first of all, people have to be motivated for something. If the thing that uh, they're supposed to be doing gives them a perceived benefit, they're going to do it. If it doesn't give them a perceived benefit and it takes more work than they have the energy to marshal, they're not going to do it. Uh, and that's true for everybody. So, you know, when I don't know about you guys, but if I have a busy family life, I may prefer to uh, have a number of meals that can be microwaved instead of doing everything from scratch, given the kind of schedule that I've got, because I'm prioritizing something else as being more important. 
And not everybody has to do everything. As you see in the example that you gave, this person's motivation, quote unquote, to do it changed as the environment changed. So I don't tend to attack motivation as a, quote, thing, but to try to understand more about what, what are the reinforcers in the environment that make the person feel like they want something versus that they don't want something? And how much effort does it take to do it? Okay, and I think we have time for, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot for one more. Um, how do we help people who don't see a role for themselves and don't believe they can experience satisfaction? And I know that you probably can't answer that question today, but maybe we can sort of give a little foreshadowing about what's to come. <laughs> People who feel so hopeless that it's hard to engage them in thinking about the future need a lot of experiences that are positive and that can give them, quote, proof of that hope. Um, so a lot of what, pardon me, mm -hmm. readiness development activities involve is trying to help that person experience something that they are successful in, no matter how small or unrelated to anything um, else that they're doing in their life and organizing experiences for the person to be able to draw on so that you can discuss with them uh, a different view of life. Like, um, yes, you're right. If, if I go rambling off into more examples, we're gonna take up more time than I've got. So if you bring that question to an office hour, I can give you a, a much fuller answer and more examples of how that works. But the basic idea is that the lack of hope is not so much a personality trait as learning from experiences. So as a psych rehab person, you try to create other experiences to meet that feeling in order to be able to help the person to become more hopeful. And also having peer support around is very helpful in, for that as well, because that's one of the main functions of people who do peer support to help the person understand what it looks like if you're a little bit further down the road than the person who's feeling so hopeless to inspire hope. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Farkas. I just want to reiterate that the office hour is next week, Thursday, the 16th. There was a typo on the screen. It's the 16th Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, you'll be getting an evaluation tomorrow afternoon from me, an email with the evaluation, as well as the link to today's recording. Please complete that evaluation and send it back to us by Monday in order to get those continuing ed credits. And as soon as other credits are approved, we will be releasing those as well. Stay tuned for more information. If you have any questions, you can email me. And I hope that we will see you next week on the office hour and then next month at the next webinar. Take care, everybody. Have a great afternoon.